The miners were on strike protesting for better pay, fighting for the right to organize, and better treatment from the operators. Thousands of people are now forced to live in tents in the small area by the Tug River. Conditions there are stable, but there are thousands out-of-work men who are angry and nothing else to do. Today, we will discuss the most infamous event of the Mate One conflict that would forever be compared to the OK Corral and the criminal trial that would light the flame to the powder keg. These two events will lead to outright war in the Appalachian Mountains and will go down as the largest armed labor uprising in America. The Stone Mountain Coal Company had hired the agents to evict the miners and to harass them until the strike broke up. Until this moment, there were very few major conflicts in the area. However, the Stone Mountain Coal Company wanted to maintain control over the situation and to suppress the continued efforts to organize. Executive Albert Feltz brought 12 Baldwin Feltz detective agents who came from Bluefield, West Virginia to Mate 1, West Virginia to break up the strike using all means necessary. Sheriff Hatfield encouraged the miners to arm themselves when the detectives arrived in Mate 1. Both Albert Feltz and C.B. Cunningham had both been involved in the violent and deadly Ludlow, Colorado strike six years earlier. Baldwin Feltz agents were now very well seasoned and learned many lessons about how to break up strikes using violent tactics and intimidation methods. On this morning, the men were hard at work evicting people from their company-owned houses and forcibly removing mining families from the independent tent camp that had formed on Lick Creek for trying to organize. Arriving at the tent site, Sheriff Hatfield and Mayor Testerman went to investigate why people from Tent City were being evicted claiming that Albert and Lee Feltz had no legal authority to do so. Hatfield and Testerman then demanded to see the warrants given to the agents for this action as they contested their authority in the township. Albert and Lee Feltz were unable to produce any warrants for their actions and falsely claimed that this situation was sanctioned by the court orders. All of this was being carried out under the watchful eye of the miners and their families. Seeing that there was trouble brewing, the miners then began to arm themselves and made their way into the town in case that there would be a larger conflict to happen. The agents then came back to mate one later that day. Both sides claimed that they had the right to arrest the other side. The verbal altercation became very heated at this point. Other sources claim that the agents were leaving town when the argument broke out between the agents and the pro-union police chief, Sid Hatfield and Mayor Testament. What is clear is that the dispute turned violent. There are details, but again, decide for yourself as to which side that you want to believe. In story one, one of the Baldwin Feltz agents moved to arrest the sheriff, and he shot and killed Mayor Testament when he stepped in to intervene on behalf of Hatfield. In story two, Hatfield initiated the shootout by either signaling a prepared ambush or shooting the agent himself. It is unclear as to who shot first to start the gunfight. However, the battle lasted a total of 15 minutes. When the shooting had stopped, 10 men, including two coal miners, Albert Feltz, his brother Lee, five other Baldwin Feltz detectives, and mate one mayor, Cable Testerman, were all dead. This event would forever be known as the Mate One Massacre. Captain Brokus raided the Lick Creek Tent Colony in June 1920. There was a gun skirmish within the colony between the miners and Brokus and the Martins men. The state police, in response, had the tents destroyed 
scattered belongings of the miners and their families, and miners were shot and arrested. It had only been three months since the Maitwan massacre, and the civil unrest was escalating. Martial law was enacted, and federal troops came into the area. This lasted for a short time as the threat of a statewide general strike of all Union coal miners of West Virginia was threatened. The federal troops backed down. The Maitwan Massacre became a rally cry for the Union activists across the country, with Sid Hatfield garnering fame for his defense of the miners. Hatfield had escaped the massacre without injury and became a symbol of the fight against tyranny and violence of the company. By July 1, 1920, the operators had seemed to lose their fight as 90% of the miners in Mingo County joined with the UMWA and joined in the strike. There are several armed skirmishes between the miners and the guard. This was because of the mine closures and rail routes, along with companies bringing in non-union replacement workers that lasted into the fall of 1920. Thomas Feltz, the Baldwin Feltz Agency Chief, hired a team of lawyers to bring charges against Sid Hatfield and 18 other men who were accused of participating in the shootout for the crime of murdering Albert Feltz. The trial began on January 28, 1921. Close to 40 armed Baldwin Feltz agents lined the streets of Williamson to intimidate the pro-union jury. After the lengthiest murder trial in West Virginia history, there was not enough evidence to bring a conviction. None of the 19 men who were indicted were convicted of the killings. The West Virginia State Legislature passed a bill allowing the criminal cases to be prosecuted with summoned juries from other counties. Murder charges were then again brought against the 19 men for the deaths of the other six Baldwin Feltz agents. Hatfield, along with Ed Chambers, his deputy, were also brought up on charges for destroying the Mohawk mining camp in McDowell County. Hatfield and Chambers traveled unarmed to court with their wives on August 1, 1921, to stand trial. Awaiting them were the Baldwin Feltz agents who shot and killed them on the McDowell County courthouse steps. C. E. Lively, Buster Pence, and Bill Salter who were Baldwin Feltz agents were acquitted of the murders of the Hatfields and Chambers on grounds of self-defense. These two events would set off a firestorm of the fight between the miners and the operators. In our next post, we will get into the reactions of the assassinations and the march of the miners from Marmot to Matewan. Thank you for continuing to watch our series and for your support of our channel.